theyeshiva.net. I want to welcome everybody who's here with us this evening, all of the teenagers, for our special program in which you can ask your real questions, tough questions, and we'll try to give real answers. Let me begin with a story. It's a story about the Zvila Rebbe. His name was Reb Gedalia Moshe Goldman. He was a son of the famous Reb Shleimke Zvila. Zvil is a city in the Ukraine. And Reb Gedalia Moshe Goldman was a rabbi in the city of Zvil in Ukraine under the communist regime. Because he was accused of counter-revolutionary activities, as they were called, against the communist Soviet Union, he was given a sentence of seven years in the Gulag, seven years of hard slave labor in Siberia. For millions of people, that spelled a death sentence because of the harsh conditions, the unbearable conditions, the cold and the frost of Siberia is indescribable. Some places it can get 70 below zero. And uh, seven years there with uh, not much food and nutrition and accommodations and constant endless labor and the horrible treatment that you got as a prisoner in Siberia, plus the diseases and the epidemics that uh, spread in those places made sure that most of the prisoners did not come out alive. And thus, Joseph Stalin, the infamous leader of the Soviet Union, managed in the 30 years of his reign of terror from 1923 till 1953. He died Purim, around Purim 1953, March 1953. He managed to kill anywhere between 20 and 50 million people. They don't even know the exact numbers, but you're dealing with tens of millions of people. Rabbi Goldman, the Zvila Rebbe, was exiled to Siberia for seven years. And finally, the great day arrived. He and another Jew, an elderly Jew who was also in Siberia, were summoned to the Nachalnik. Nachalnik was like the, the one who was the overseer, the boss in his makeshift office in the Gulag. He was in charge on what's happening with the prisoners. And the man turned, the Nachalnik, this officer, this Russian officer, turned to these two, two Jews, the Zvila Rebbe. He wasn't then the Zvila Rebbe, his father was still alive, but he was the Rav of Zvil, and the other elderly Jew, who was a secular Jew. And he says, I have good news for you. The day of your liberation has arrived. You're free to leave Siberia and go home. Imagine. Here, here are the papers. Sign the papers so you can leave. And Reb Gedalia Moshe Goldman from Zivil says to the officer, he says, I'm sorry, but I can't sign. It's Shabbos. It's Shabbos today. I can't sign. He's thinking to himself, you're allowed to violate Shabbos to save a life. But I'm more or less fine. I'm not sick. I survived seven years. I'll be able to survive longer. I'm not going to violate the Shabbos. He was a holy, very holy Jew. The man was perplexed and shocked. He says, what? You could leave this place. He says, I know, and I thank you, but today is Shabbos, and I do not write on Shabbos. I'll stay here longer. He says, if you don't sign now, you will not get out of this place. This is your day of liberation. And he thinks to himself, can't get himself to write on Shabbos. He says, whatever God wants to happen to me will happen to me, but I'm not violating the Shabbos. I'm not breaking Shabbos. Even in Siberia, he felt he doesn't want to break Shabbos, doesn't want to lose his identity. In that sense, he remained a free man. Now, the Nachalni gave the papers to the second Jew, who wasn't a very religious Jew, and certainly had every excuse in the world to be able to sign on Shabbos and get out of that Siberian purgatory. But this Jew, seeing the sacrifice of the Rav of Zvil, 
Reb Gedalia Moshe Goldman, he, he couldn't get himself to sign. Like he felt it would be a spit in the face of the Rav of Zvil if he signs and leaves. He just couldn't get himself to sign. So out of respect, despite the crazy circumstances, this elderly Jew said, oh, I also can sign today. It's our holy day of Shabbos. God said that on Shabbos we rest, we don't sign. As this officer is looking at both of these people, as though they just fell off from the moon, the Rav of Zavil, Rav Goldman, turns to the officer and says, I can't sign for myself because I don't think it's a matter of life and death. And we're only allowed to violate Shabbos if it's a matter of life and death. I can survive here longer. But this Jew, I don't think he can survive here. I will sign the papers for him. <laughs> for him, I could sign the papers and let him go free. I will do his signature in front of him so he can go free. And the officer was so taken aback by this. He looks at both of them and he says, you know what? I will sign for both of you and you can go free. And that's indeed what happened. Years later, he came to Eretz Yisrael, he came to the Holy Land and after his father, Passing in 1945, I think Tov Shinhei, he succeeded his father as the fifth, I think the fifth uh, Rebbe of, uh, of Zeville. It was the late 1940s when his father passed away. Story number one. I want to share with you another story. My dearest friends, teenagers from all over the world who are with us. I heard the story from a man named Rabbi J.J. Schechter. He shared this with me directly, personally. He heard it from the man it happened with, a fellow in Israel by the name of Aryeh Eldad. Aryeh Eldad has an interesting job. He travels, as you know, in Israel, most high schools, after the graduating year, most of the students move on and have to go to the army and serve in the army in the IDF, Tzahal, for three years. And it's not easy. It's not an easy transition. You just graduated high school. You know, still a young, pretty, pretty young guy. So in America, you move on. But in Israel, most of the high schools, you go, you get drafted to the army. Arye Eldad has a very interesting job. He goes from high school to high school and he spends time with the seniors, with the graduating class to help prepare them for this major emotional and practical and psychological transition from a life, you know, in their homes, more or less burden-free and stress-free, good teenagers, and uh, off to the army. It's not an easy transition. And this is what he's been doing for years. He speaks to the students, and he fabrings with them, and he answers their questions, and he, he takes them out, and they visit different places. This is his job, his vocation. Eldad, Arye Eldad shared this story with Rabbi J.J. Schechter, who shared it with uh, yours truly. Right, he says, one particular class in a particular high school, I was having a very difficult time. These kids were just very, very not interested. <laughs> and I couldn't blame them. They were tough. They were oblivious. They were apathetic. They were indifferent. And it was just a very difficult situation. And uh, I, couldn't get, I couldn't get anywhere. And, you know, his job is to inspire within these children, mostly from secular Jewish families, uh, the historic right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, the fact that today there are millions of Jews there who need to be protected, the fact that it's protected through Jewish children who put their life on the line. You know, he speaks about previous soldiers and their sacrifices and the life that they're going to live for the next three years. Now, the last day, he usually takes the kids out, you know, they go different places. He shows them things. The last day, usually he takes them to Mount Herzl, Har Herzl, near Jerusalem, where so many soldiers who died in the previous wars in Israel are buried. He said, I'm this particular class, which was very difficult, and he took them around different places in Israel, and then the last day to go to Mount Herzl. And over there, there's a section for soldiers who were killed during each war. There was the War of 1948, there was the War of 1956, there was the Six-Day War of 1967, the Yom Kippur War of 1973, Lebanon War, the first Lebanon War of 1982, and so on and so forth, including the recent uh, Gaza conflicts during the last few years. And it, it has a sign over there, the soldiers of this battle, that battle, that battle. 
And the first group is 1948, Tov Shin Ches. This was known as the War of Independence, which began after <coughs> the, the United Nations allowed the Jews to create a state. The Arabs began a war against the Jewish people in Israel. And later when they established the state, the war accelerated. 6,000 Jews were killed in that war, which was a huge number. There were only 600,000 Jews living in Israel at the time. Most of the people who were killed were Holocaust survivors. This went on through the end of 47, 1948, and part of 1949. It's called the War of Independence. There were, I think, seven or eight Arab armies who besieged Israel and promised that it would be completely obliterated and annihilated. But great miracles happened despite the terrible, terrible loss the fact is that the Jewish people can emerge from this absolute decree of annihilation. They wanted another Auschwitz there and uh, could continue living a semi-normal life there and allow all the refugees to come and all the Holocaust survivors to settle and Jews who had to leave all the other Arab countries could find a home. They're going through the graves of the soldiers buried in 1948. And of course, every tombstone has, you know, the name, the first name, the last name, the day he was killed, sometimes details where the war happened, the platoon, the name of the group that fought. He brings them to a grave. And on the grave, on the matzev, on the tombstone, you have the date of the battle, the date, the yard site, the day that this particular soldier was killed. It also specifies the location where he was killed and the name of the platoon, the name of the group of soldiers which he belonged to. But there's no first name and there's no last name. Instead, it says, Poi Nitman al Here is buried the anonymous figure. And the boys look at Aryeh and say, what's going on? They want to have a name. And he tells them the story. This kid, this soldier, was a survivor of the Holocaust. He was in the death camps. He lost his entire family. After the Holocaust, somehow he made illegal aliyah to Eretz Yisrael, to Israel, which was then called Palestine under the British mandate. He way made one of these illegal ships. He got up to the country land. And when he landed, the war has begun. The war was already, the war of independence was already raging. And you know what happened? They gave this young man a gun and they said, we need you to fight. And he joined a platoon that was fighting near Jerusalem. And the next day, he and 69 other young soldiers fell in battle. And they performed the funerals and they buried them. When they came to his, they realized a tragedy. They didn't know his name. There was no records of him. They didn't know his first name. They didn't know his last name. There was no family or friends to escort him. His family was murdered in the Holocaust. The only ones who probably would have known his name were the group of soldiers he was serving with, but they were all killed. 69 of them were killed. And it happens to be that nobody was present who knew this boy's name. So they knew the date that he died. They knew where he died, and they knew the battle in which he died and the name of the platoon. But that's it. So therefore, on the tombstone, it says, Poi Nitman al the anonymous one. And these kids, Arye says, were visibly moved. The story penetrated them. And they turned to Arye Eldan and they said, Who says Kaddish for this boy? Who gives charity for him? Who remembers him? Who says Yisker for him? Whoever mentions his name? And Ariel Dutt says, nobody mentions his name. Nobody knows his name. Nobody says Yisker for him. Nobody remembers him. Nobody does anything for him. We don't know who he is. But today we come to his grave. They were very, very moved. And Arya used this opportunity to share with them the story of the Jewish people who emerged from the Holocaust, literally from the ashes. And an, an incredible experience rebuilt Jewish life, rebuilt the Jewish homeland, and rebuilt Jewish life all over the world. And about these people, these young people who sacrifice everything they have to protect their brothers and sisters, millions of them, living in their eternal 
promised land. The children, they weren't children, they were teenagers, I'm calling them children, I guess everything is relative, were very, very uh, affected. This was the last day and life moved on and soon they graduated and they were drafted into the Israeli army. Ariel Dot says, almost a year passes. He gets a call from one of the boys in this group. He said, ah, Arie, you remember us? Yeah, of course. This was the group that he took last year around Israel trying to inspire them. It wasn't an easy job, but he took them to Mount Herzl. And they say, you know, Arie, we have unbelievable news for you. He says, what's the news? He says, you remember the grave of that kid, of that soldier, whom we visited last year and it said on it, Almoini Anonymous? He says, of course I remember. It's not the first time I went. I go there very, very often with the boys of the high school. I want to show them what's happening. They said, you know, Arye, today is the yard site. On the tombstone, you have the yard site. Today is his yard site. He says, wow, I didn't realize. What's going on? Why are you calling me? And they say in Hebrew, Matsanu hamishpacha shalom. We found his family. He thought they were crazy. They were in the army but they maybe lost their mind. What do you mean you found his family? How do you search for his family when you don't have a name, you don't have a picture, you don't have ID papers, you have nothing, you have a grave. They couldn't even do, today you have DNA testing, but they couldn't even do DNA testing because who are they supposed to match it up with? (laughs) You have the DNA, who do you match it up with? Every single Jew in Israel, every single Jew in America, every single Jew in England and South, who do you match it up with? So he says, what are you talking about? They said, we found his family. We found Matsano Mishpachat And because today is the yard site, the family is going to the grave to say Kaddish, to learn Mishnayis for his memory, to give tzedakah for his memory, and to daven for his soul, for his neshama, on this special day. And if you want, you're welcome to come and join the family. He was so curious. He was perplexed. This did not make sense to him. Gets into the car, drives to Mount Herzl to go visit the family of Mr. Anonymous. Wondering in his mind, it's been 70 years since this young man was buried. Since this young man was killed, Al-Kiddush Hashem protecting the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael. 70 years. Where do you find family after 70 years? Of course, as he comes to the grave. Who's there? He sees all the boys, all the boys a year before. They were all there. As he looked at them with tears in their eyes, they said, Arye, Matsanu Hamishpachashalo, Anachnu Hamishpachashalo. We found his family. We are his family. Anachnu, we are his family. And he said, they continued to commemorate this young soldier's yard site every single year. Both these stories left such a profound impact on me. Different circumstances, different people, different situations. But the words of those young teenagers who said, Anachnu HaMishpachat Shalom, we found his family We are his family. Wow. And I say this to you because you are the same age of these young men, a little older, a little younger. And one of the most powerful resources we have is each other. We are all family. Yes, we may be physically distant, but spiritually we're one. Yes, some of us are actually family biologically and some of us are not family. But first of all, if you go back long enough, we're all family. And even if you don't go by long enough, spiritually, emotionally, historically, culturally, religiously, we're family. And I want you to remember that we're not just isolated people, you know, living on the surface 
as a blimp on a surface of infinity, everybody struggling to survive and be happy and find your own comfort. That's part of it. But as Hillel said, if I'm not here for me, who will be here for me? But if I'm only for myself, then who am I? You are part of a golden chain that continues thousands of years. And these are not only words. It's so vital to be able to experience this, to be able to breathe this, to be able to appreciate in your bones, with every fiber of your being, how you are part of this grand cosmic symphony called Knesset Yisrael, that we are all family, a family that has dedicated its entire mission to change the world, to make it a world that's worthy of redemption, to transform the landscape of planet Earth, to make it a place of, of goodness, of kindness, of holiness, of purity, a nation that has been dedicated and defined itself and was chosen to be ambassadors, ambassadors of light and love and hope and healing and truth and honesty and redemption. And each and every single one of you is part of this mishpacha. Anachnu ha-mishpacha shalom. We're family. And I want you always to know that that connection is real and that connection is authentic and you could rely and trust that connection. And you become that connection for other people. Because it's this unity that allows us to sustain every hardship and every obstacle. Our resilience, our courage, our resolve, and our strength come so much from the fact that we are all family. We are all here for each other. We're part of each other. We may not always agree with each other. Family members don't always agree with each other. In fact, there's no fight like a family feud. Oy, 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 oy. That's why when Jews fight, it's pretty nasty. Because when a family gets into a fight, oh, you don't want to be part of it. But on the other hand, we love each other like family. We trust each other like family. We have to support each other like family. And it's not just with the Jews of this generation. It's every Jew who lived from Avram Avinu till Mashiach. It's all one unit. It's all one mishpacha. It's all one family. As the Gemara says in Hurius, I think, Davhei, Davav, Tzibur Loi Meis. An individual can die. The community never dies. Kalal Yisrael doesn't die. An individual person finishes his or her mission and passes away. But the entity of the Jewish people, the entity called Am Yisrael, Knesset Yisrael, Bnei Yisrael, that entity doesn't die. How does it die? As long as there's one Jew who continues, Yiddishkeit, it doesn't die. So that means the same Klal Yisrael that was present at the feet of Har Sinai is the same Klal Yisrael present today, Tov Shin Pei 2020 amidst coronavirus. It's the same Jewish people, the same Klal Yisrael that has halachic ramifications in terms of a carbon, as the Gemara explains there, but it's beyond the realm of this year. So understand your power. You're not just approaching life as an individual, even though you're also an individual, but you're also approaching life as an agent, as an ambassador, as a representative, and as one who perpetuates the body called the Mishpacha, the family of Klal Yisrael, from Avram Avinu until Mashiach. That's who you are. Always remember that and maximize that potential. See this identity in yourself, my dearest friends. And now let us go to the questions of you guys. As usual, there are quite a lot of questions. And I think we have somebody from Vienna. Let's start. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. My name is Avi Unger. I'm from Vienna. Um, my question is, I wanted to ask, Everybody's saying there are so many chizik stories going around and things, and I'm, I try to do them, but I realized I don't even know what are my talents. I mean, I know, but I don't really know. I'm trying still to find myself. How do I know who am I? How can I know what kind of person am I? And how can I get a better person. I want to get better. How can I get a better person? Thank you. 
Wow. wow. First, First of all, welcome, welcome Avi, Avi, Avi from, from Vienna. Vienna. Wow, Vienna, Vienna Austria. Austria. Thank, Thank you, Avi, for, for that, uh, that, that question. question. I'm, I'm sure, sure you heard the question. The question, the question was, I hear, I hear all these speeches, speeches you, know, you know, trying, trying to inspire, inspire people, people and tell them to get, get better. better. But, but I don't, I don't even know who I am. I am. <laughs> in, order in order to get, get better, better, you have to know who you are, are and then you could work on yourself. And I, don't I don't even know who I am. am. How do I, I find, find out who I am, am and how, how I could become, become a, better a better person? person. Wow, wow, that's that's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a deep question. That's a very deep question. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little story to uh, <laughs> to begin my answer. The story I heard from the rabbi at Duke University, his name is Rabbi Zalman Blooming, and he shared with me that a professor in Duke University began his, uh, his lecture, his semester. He was a teacher of, he is a teacher of philosophy. So a number of years ago, it was like I think four or five years ago, he opened up his philosophy lectures to all the students in Duke in his classroom. He opened it up with a story about a chassid in Russia. Now, this is Duke University, an Ivy League university, a very secular university, and a liberal university. And But this professor opens up the story, the story of a chassid in Russia. And the story, he says, goes like this. He says, there was once a chassid in Russia who was walking. And a policeman stops him. And the policeman says, okay, man, in Russian, of course, I want you to tell me, number one, who are you? Number two, where are you coming from? Number three, where are you going? Number four, what is your vocation? What do you do with your life? These questions were normal questions. A policeman could stop you anywhere in the Soviet Union and demand an answer to these questions and you had to answer and also show documentation to prove it. And if not, you can end up not in a place where you want to end up. These are the questions. The chassid looks at the policeman. He was a very sincere person, authentic person. And maybe, you know, his head was very, very much in the heavens as well. And he looks at the policeman. He says, wow, wow, wow. I want to make a deal with you. I'm going to give you five ruble every day. If you can come and ask me these questions on a daily basis, who am I? Where I come from? Where am I going? And what am I doing with my life? This is how the professor and Duke chose to begin his semester. What a good question, Avi. What a beautiful question. Who am I? Where I come from? Where am I going? What is my occupation in life? And the answer, of course, is... Who are you? You're a child of Hashem. You're God's manifestation in this world. You're a chelik elikami mal. You're a piece of beauty. You're a piece of holiness. You're a piece of goodness. Your soul is on a journey. Your body is a manifestation of your godliness, and you're here to light up the world. That's who you are. Where are you going? You're going to that destination. Now you have to figure out how to get from point A to point B. And what I would suggest to you is two things. First of all, listen to yourself. Spend time with yourself, especially in davening. But moments of quiet, of meditation, of reflection. Just allow yourself to listen to your innermost voice. This is very important. Number two. Speak to some people who you trust, maybe parents, maybe relatives, maybe a teacher, maybe a therapist. Speak to one or two people, or it could be a few people, people who are a little older than you, who are a little more experienced than you, who can help you crystallize to you and identify more, with help you identify more qualities about yourself and how you should uh, cultivate your resources, your gifts, your talents, and how to create a schedule for yourself that will help you get to the places you want to get. A very important thing in this question, my dear Avi, is this. There's no mitzvah to overanalyze yourself. There was once a professor of anatomy 
and he was talking to his students for two hours about all of the muscles and the bones and the limbs and the arteries and the sinews and the tissue and the nerves in the leg. And at the end of the lecture, nobody could stand up to walk <laughs> because suddenly they realized how much effort it takes simply to stand up and take a single step. When we become so aware of all of the details, we sometimes get paralyzed. So that's why, Avi, it's important to answer this question, but don't get overwhelmed with this question. The most important thing is to live your life, to walk, not to sit and analyze the leg unless you're going to medical school to figure out how the leg works. And even then you have to still walk. The most important thing in life is throw yourself into life. It's not healthy to sit all day on the couch and analyze myself. Who am I? Why am I? When am I? Those questions are important. Address them. You need time to address them. But most of our lives must be occupied with walking, with moving, with doing. The greatest experience of life comes through experiencing life. And how do you experience life? When you throw yourself into life, throw yourself into projects that are important, throw yourself into study that is productive, hang out with people, have friends, reach out, cultivate relationships, get involved in life because the experience of life is the greatest teacher of what life is about, Avi. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. If anybody wants to come on live, feel free. You can come to the yeshiva.net and you'll see on the video page, you can ask a question and indicate that you want to go live and you can come live. You can also email live at the yeshiva.net if you want to come live on the video, or you can just text your questions on the page. You see, ask your question. You can write your question on the page and we get it immediately. Or if you're on the phone, you can text your question to 845-777-4747. Let me go now to the next question. Thank you very, very much. I see dozens and dozens and dozens of questions came in. So let's try to do this. Okay, Chaya asks, I suffer from anxiety. I have many fears and worries that I must confront on a daily basis. During this virus, these worries are obviously much greater. Is my worrying a lack of trust in Hashem? How do I differentiate between anxiety as a result of mental illness and anxiety as a lack of trust in God? Wow, great, great question, Chaya. And here comes another question. When the coronavirus started, I felt so unsettled. This is a question from Chana. Everyone around me was nervous. The governments were at a loss. Every single person in the world displayed their lack of security and vulnerability. It was being absorbed by me. The first thing I needed to do was watch a class of Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson. In my mind, I thought, if Rabbi Y.Y. displays any emotion of stress or anxiety, then that's it. I won't be able to handle it. I will also be anxious. I watched your class, and you sat there, radiating happiness and joy, and I felt so relieved. I was now assured that it was good, and I was able to continue with serenity and tranquility. Please answer my question. Tell me, what is the secret to your strength, to your faith, to your trust? I also want to feel it all the time. I desperately want to have tranquility. I want to be able to live a truly happy life. Can you recommend something practical that I could start to do to enable myself to genuinely be at peace with everything that happens in life. Complete and unwavering trust. Thank you for each one of your classes. They have helped me so, so much. Wow, Hannah. <laughs> That's very moving, very, very moving. And I thank you so, so much. And thank you, Chaya, for your question. And thank you all of the young men and young women who asked about this anxiety issue. This is a very common question coming in. And I would love to address it for a few moments. I want to say this. I don't think it's fair to tell somebody or to tell yourself that anxiety represents a lack of trust in God. I don't think that's the case. There is a concept called a person has anxiety despite their faith in God. Yes, is it possible 
that some people's faith in God eliminates all of their anxiety? Of course, that's the case. But to feel guilty and to accuse yourself or to allow others to accuse you of lacking faith and trust in Hashem, emunah and betachen, and that's why you have anxiety, only comes from somebody who either doesn't understand what anxiety is or doesn't understand what trust in Hashem is. And that's why I completely disagree with such an observation. Again, trust in Hashem can help anxiety tremendously. For some people, it can eliminate anxiety, but not necessarily. Sometimes anxiety is a very, very serious condition. A person has it despite their amuna, despite their trust, despite their faith. It does not eliminate all of the anxiety. And it's very important to stop accusing yourself of not having faith because you have anxiety. Sometimes a person needs a therapist to deal with anxiety. Sometimes a person needs a different schedule to deal with anxiety. Sometimes a person needs somebody very good to talk to who understands about anxiety to help them with their anxiety. Sometimes a person needs maybe vitamins or medicine to deal with their anxiety. These are options that have to be explored and dealt with, but only with a top, top expert in this area. And sometimes a person cannot eliminate their anxiety. You know what trust in Hashem does? Trust in Hashem for some people can eliminate anxiety, but for other people it does something else. It means that Hashem is with you despite the anxiety, amidst the anxiety. That's what it means. And the key truth about anxiety, what I find is this. At least one of the key truths about anxiety is you are not your anxiety. You are not your anxiety. You are larger than your anxiety. You can notice your anxiety. There is always an eye that can observe your anxiety because you are not synonymous with your anxiety. My eye can contain my anxiety because it's larger than my anxiety. My eye is divine. My eye is infinite. My eye is wholesome, confident, happy. I can look at my anxiety. I can observe it. I can learn from it. I once heard somebody speak about anxiety and he said something very powerful, which was helpful. He said, you know, when you're experiencing anxiety, make sure that you create a time when you're going to go meet your anxiety, make an appointment with your anxiety. Maybe right now I can't because I have to do something. I have to meet somebody. I have a project to do. I have to finish something, but make a time three o'clock tomorrow. I'm going to have an appointment with my anxiety. Go meet it and sit down with it and don't blame it. And don't get upset at it. Have a conversation with it. Ask your anxiety, what are you telling me? Why are you anxious? And let the conversation be very calm. Listen to your anxiety. Listen to it. Don't judge it. Don't repress it. Don't scream at it. Just listen to it in a very, very calm and non-judgmental way. And sometimes it's going to be a process. Somebody even told me that they wrote down the conversation. The anxiety answered, and they answered back, and the anxiety went a little deeper, and they went a little deeper, and the anxiety went a little deeper, and they went a little deeper, and the anxiety went a little deeper. And after an hour, the anxiety told them, you are just frightened of what people are going to think about you. (laughs) You're just frightened of what people are going to think about you. Wow, why am I frightened about what people are going to think about me? And this person who did this told me, I realized then that the anxiety was my friend. The anxiety was really a message that was communicating to me love. The anxiety was a shifer that was sounding an alarm and saying, there's something misaligned about you. There's something not wholesome about you. You're involved in your life, but there's something, there's some belief that you're carrying. There is some story that you're telling yourself that is causing you not to be able to live life to the fullest, not to be able to celebrate life, not to be able to live life in the moment. That anxiety is really, it sounds like your enemy, but it's really your friend. It's your body telling you, my dearest friend, I love you so much. And I want to alert you. I literally want to alert you, an alarm clock. I want to wake you up to the fact that there's something at your core that's eating up at you. And you know what? You should deal with it. And in that sense, your anxiety can become a tremendous source of awareness, of education, 
of self-development and of self-actualization. Can you always do this by yourself? No. But this is the message of anxiety in all of its manifestations. So I repeat again, it has nothing to do with your lack of trust in God. It's important to notice your anxiety and not to identify with it as it being you. Make an appointment with your anxiety and learn from it. And yes, a relationship with God means that you know that you are not your anxiety and that the voice of anxiety does not capture your essence because my essence is wholesome and confident and powerful and invincible. You know why? Because it's a manifestation of Hashem in this world. So it's not anxious. God is not anxious. My core is not anxious. What do we say every morning in davening? In God's space, there is confidence and there is joy. When you're in Hashem's space, there is confidence and there is joy. But we have other voices in us. And those other voices in us take us out of that space and tell us and put us in another space. It's fine. It's normal. Notice it. Learn from it. Grow from it. And cut yourself some slack because sometimes it's not easy to get rid of. That's at least part of a perspective to a pretty loaded and heavy question. Let's go to the next question. If, again, anybody could write in their questions, you could come to the yeshiva.net to our video, ask a question. If you want to go live as well, you are welcome. If you have a Evadia, Evadia is asking this question. If you have a not yet religious family member, how can you try to bring them closer to Judaism? If it's a family member, it's very, very important to develop a good and warm relationship. And the situation really varies about who this person is, their nature, your relationship with them. Usually when it comes to family, it can get a little sticky because family is so close. So it gets a little sticky, depends how close you are to them. I don't know, you didn't specify, but just a few things I'll mention. The greatest thing is when you are a living example, when you are a living example of what Yiddishkeit can do for a person, that can become a tremendous source of inspiration. Another idea is to invite this person to experience a Shabbos with you and your family, maybe to learn with somebody, maybe invite them to a class or a class or a lecture, maybe send them a book if they're interested in or a nice video that can inspire them. You know, try to engage them, but from a place of non-judgmentalism and from a place of love. Do not get into arguments and fighting and who's going to win and I'm right, because usually, especially with family, even not with family, that leads nowhere. Rabbi, you have explained in many classes that at our essence, each one of us is a piece of God. This is called the nefesh kiss. You also explained that we have an animal soul that naturally pulls us away from doing the will of God because it's an animal. My question is, what do we call the I who experiences life? Who is listening to the class right now? My godly soul or my animal soul? Who is the one that chooses to be in flow with their godly soul or with their animal soul? Who chooses? Who chooses that the Yitzhahara doesn't take control of the wheel in your famous example of the steering wheel? Who is the observer of both of them and who is the one that chooses? Another question is, you often teach in your classes that everything is a manifestation of divine unity. So that means there's no difference between the divine soul and the animal soul because everything is part of God's oneness, even the animal soul. That is an absolutely great question. Excellent, excellent question. The answer to your question is given, is the answer to your question is given by the Tzamach Tzedek, the grandson of the Balatanya. And he says that it's the conscious and perhaps also the unconscious mind which can observe distinct voices and emotions and vibrations in your psyche. 
It's your conscious and unconscious mind which can observe the conflict going on in you. One voice which maintains that I am separate from Hashem, I am animalistic, and another voice that maintains the idea and the awareness that I am part of infinity. So if I remain open and inquisitive, I can clearly hear the two voices. And it then allows me to choose how to define my behavior, my thoughts, my words, my actions, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, one day at a time. Choice can only come when there's an awareness of various alternatives. So there is that I, which he calls the nefesh hasichlis, the conscious or unconscious mind, which can observe both and then make a choice between the two. Everything is ultimately part of God's unity. But an animal soul is often called in Hasidic and Kabbalistic texts and texts of Musr, a soul that comes from Klippa, which means a husk. Everything is part of God's unity. The difference between the divine soul and animal soul is not if they are part of God's unity, but how they experience themselves from their perspective. The divine soul consciously experiences itself as an ambassador of Hashem in this world, as a conduit for Hashem's light, love, and compassion in this world. And the animal soul, like an animal, is clueless of that identity. It's the truth of that identity, but it has to be worked with. You have to educate it and refine it and elevate it and sublimate it. And that's what the Mishnah means in the ninth chapter of Meseches Brachas, V'ahavtas Hashem alekecha b'chol avavcha b'shnei yitzarecha. You should love God with your entire heart, with both of your inclinations. How can you or love God? I thought it's a bad inclination because it's not essentially bad and evil. It's called an animal consciousness. It can become a monster. An animal, if it's not tamed, it can really, really become undomesticated and pretty aggressive and wild. But essentially, it's about education. And when we educate the animal soul, we can even sublimate it and elevate it and refine it like you elevate and you refine and you inspire a child. If a child is uneducated, if you don't teach a child right from wrong, if you don't teach a child values, if you don't teach a child that there's certain things you don't do, you have to discipline yourself, he can grow up to be a monster. That's why chinuch is so important. But education is not here to destroy the child. It's here to cultivate the values, the, the diamond at the core of the child. Sometimes the child will follow you begrudgingly. At some point, the child will follow you with enthusiasm, eagerly, and passion. And these are the processes in which we can elevate our animal soul. I loved, loved, loved your question. That's that's a great question. Let's go to the next question. I always heard and learned a girl from London, a girl from London. Welcome, Europe. I always heard and learned that God only gives challenges to a person if he can overcome them But if this is true, what about all the people who go away from the Jewish path? They were obviously in so much pain and they have so much anger and they couldn't overcome their challenges. This means that God gave them a challenge that they could not deal with. The pain was overbearing and therefore they ran away from Judaism. So it's not true that everybody can overcome the challenge. It's certainly not black and white. And another young woman, another girl says... I also don't relate to this. Obviously, there are people who cannot deal with what they're given. And this is a very important question. This has been on my mind since seventh grade when my teacher taught this to me. Wow. You guys are asking great, great questions. I love you. (laughs) Wonderful questions, all of you. So let me share this with you. You know, Bilam, Bilam's famous words to the Jewish people, he says, Matoy, we say it every morning, Matoivu Oyalecha Yaakov, right? Mishkan Esachi Yisrael. How good are the tents of Yaakov? Remember what Rashi says? She'en Pischen Mechavon and Zenegadzeh. Bilam observed the interesting fact that the opening to Jewish tents never paralleled each other, which means when I looked out from my opening, from my door, I could never see what's going on inside inside your opening because they were not parallel to each other. So from my tent, I couldn't see what's going on in yours. 
on one level, it's about modesty, about sensitivity, about respect, about the fact that there's something called privacy. But there is also another message here, and that is statements like this, God gives a person only what he or she can handle, are designated for you to say to yourself and for me to say to myself, not to figure out what is happening in somebody else's life. Every person has their own journey. You and I will never, never be able to experience what other people are going through in their life. I must tell myself, if I'm having a challenge, if God gave me the challenge, he also gave me the resources to be able to confront the challenge and allow me to emerge from it wiser, deeper, and more blessed. If you're going through a challenge, my job is not to come to you and say, oh, by the way, let me just tell you something. You can go through this challenge. My job is to be here for you, to support you in any way I can, and not to be there and share with you objectively, by the way, don't be so spoiled, you can go through this challenge. Yes, I believe in it, and I want to support you in this, but my job is to help you in your journey, help you in your process in the best way that I can do. That's number one. Number two, we never understand, as I said, the journey of other people and what they're going through and why they have to go through what they're going through. It's very, very mysterious. I'm going to quote to you a great Jewish philosopher who lived in the 11th century in Spain. His name was Reb Shloyme Ibn Gabiru. He was a great poet. And he has a beautiful poem and he says, I'm quoting one line, he says, we run away from you towards you. We run away from you, going towards you. What did he mean? He means that a Jew, even when he or she runs away from Hashem, is really running towards Hashem. It's like when your children, when children are running away from their parents, only for one purpose, right? So Tati should chase after him or her. They're running away from Hashem, but they're really running towards Hashem. It's a very, very deep statement. Or let me quote the great tzaddik, the holy Rabbi Stroll of Rizhin. Rabbi Stroll of Rizhin once said, this is quite a daring statement. He said, when a Jew does a sin, really what he's doing, he's creating a new, uh, a new path to Hashem off the beaten track. Meaning there's a certain path where we go to Hashem. There's a path, it's called the path of Torah, the path of mitzvahs. It's like the highway. Sometimes a Jew says, I'm not going on the highway. I'm going into the forest, right? And it's not a, you can't get through. He says, when a Jew sins, he's really creating a new, unprecedented path to Hashem off the beaten track. Why? Because the Gemara says in Yuma, page 86, that when a Jew does tshuva out of love, the sins become mitzvahs. So the sin is the beginning of a process that's going to lead him or her to tshuva. And then the very sin is going to retroactively be transformed into a mitzvah. What is my point? My point is we never understand the journey of a soul. Our job is to be here for every soul to the best we can. Sometimes they make unbelievable decisions that seem wonderful. Sometimes they make very painful decisions and they're going off the beaten track. But remember, their soul is on a journey. And sof kol sof, ultimately, lo yidach mimenu nidach. No soul is forever cast away. It may go through many winding roads and pathways, some of them very painful, some of them very difficult. But remember, yiridit tzayr chaliyah. Ultimately, every descent becomes the springboard for an ascent. And every journey, even if it's over the beaten track, a Jewish soul ultimately turns that journey into a new path for God. Questions. Let us go back to the questions. And there are many, many of them. If you want to go live, as you come in and ask your question, you could indicate that you want to go live on the yeshiva.net. If you come into the page and you see, ask a question, you can go to the yeshiva.net, the homepage. And over there, there is the program with teenagers, Rabbi YY with teens, and you'll see ask a question. And over there, you could check off the option that you want to come live, and you can come live on video if you wish. We have now dozens and dozens and dozens of questions. It seems to me that there are around 150 questions here. 
even though I didn't count, but approximately. Okay, so let's move on with more questions. Wow, these are these are good questions. Whoopsie. Whoopsie. Okay, that was a mistake. Fine. Okay, this is a question from Binyamin. Thank you, Binyamin. There is so much I don't know. Welcome to the club. And so much to learn. Welcome to the club. I know that there are basics I have to know that I just never get around to learning. One day I'll hear a rabbi say it's important to review what you learn in class. The next day I'll hear a speech about the importance to know all of the Tanakh. And then I'll hear that you need to know halacha. Then I'll hear that a certain book is a classic and you have to learn it and so on and so on and so on. If I do everything I and others feel I should know, I'm going to cover very, very little. How is it possible to properly prioritize and know what to spend my extra time learning? That's a, a very, very good question. And the answer to your question is, don't get overwhelmed. Remember the words of the Mishnah. Your job is not to finish everything. On the other hand, don't use that as an excuse not to begin. Whatever you learn, the most important thing is that it should become part of the learning and the next day you're on to something else, you already forgot what you learned yesterday. The challenge I find is that a lot of people learn, but because they never really mastered the material and understood it, it doesn't stay with them. So it's not a foundation. It's like imagine you're building a foundation of the house, but the foundation itself is weak. You can't build on it. You want to build on your learning. The way you build on your learning is that whatever you learn, you learn, you make sure you understand it. If you have to go slow, go slow. Better to learn a little bit that you really get than to learn a lot that is just superficial and you just believe what it says in the texts. So much better to be honest with who you are and learn a little bit based on your level of understanding. You know, I'll be very frank with you. There are boys in yeshiva that are learning Gemara all day, but really they never learned how to learn Mishnayas. They don't know a Mishnah. They're learning Gemara, they're learning Rashi, they're learning Toysfis, they're learning Marsha, Maram Shif, Rebbe Kiva Eger, Reb Chayim. They don't know how to read the Mishnah. They don't know the basics. They don't know how to develop an idea from the beginning, from the bottom, all the way up. Some of them don't know how to read a Pasuk Chumash with Rashi. So, and I feel bad because they're deceiving themselves. They want to fit into the culture, but there's no success. And the reason there's no success is like Pisa and Ramses, right? Whatever they were building, Rashi says, the Gemara says in Saito, whatever they were building was just crumbling. So it's very important, whatever you learn, to learn in a slow way that you can internalize it, and then you build on it. And then slowly, slowly, you read a Sefer, you learn another Sefer. Maybe you want to learn Tanakh every day. You can also make times. You could do 10 minutes a day this. You could do a half an hour this. It's good to have diversity in your learning. What I would suggest is you should always do the Parsha of Chumash with Rashi during the week. So throughout the year, you know Chumash Chumshatari with Rashi. That takes not a long time. Every day, Sunday you do from Rishi to Shani, Monday Shani to Shlishi, Tuesday Shlishi to Ravi. That's a very good limud. You master Chumash and Rashi every single day. It's very, very important to learn. Spend a little time on halacha, to know halacha. The Gemara that you learn, make sure you understand it. You internalize it. If you have to go a little slower, go slower. And then other svarim, you want to learn Tanakh, you can make a time to learn Tanakh, but make times, don't get overwhelmed. What you learn, learn slowly, review it. It's also important, I would suggest, to learn a sefer that's inspirational, that explores the spiritual and emotional relevance of Yiddishkeit. That, I think, is very important to make time every day to learn. These are some suggestions I would give you, my dear friend, Bin Yamin. All people have free will, but we are kind of forced to try our best because otherwise we're punished, aren't we? How is it fear that God put us in the world without a choice? Okay, very good question. And now there's a question from Racheli. This has been bothering me now. I asked many people, I never got an answer that satisfied me. I was always told that we humans were created with the nature of making mistakes, and there's no way to get around that. 
Hashem doesn't want us to be perfect. And he created us that way for a reason, not to be perfect. It sounds very nice. But at the end of the day, we are punished for the mistakes that we make. How can Hashem accuse us of a nature that he put us in, the nature of not being perfect? Yes, we're trying to become better, but we do fall on the way and we get punished for that. I feel that it's unfair. Why are we punished for things that we don't choose to do? Because imperfection is part of who we are. It's a great question, Racheli, and it's a great question to the other person who asked the question, I think also Binyamin. And the answer is, I really don't see it that way. I think you have to really change your paradigm of how you're looking at the relationship you have with Hashem. Hashem loves you unlimitedly, without limits. The Baal Shem Tov says that Hashem loves every Jew more than a parent loves an only child who was born when they were older and they didn't expect to have a child. You can imagine how deep the love is. The love of Hashem to every single Jew is infinitely greater than that. Don't think of Hashem in terms, ooh, I created them, I made them imperfect, I gave them a Yetzirah, and now when they act out that imperfection, ooh, I punished them. What's the point? Unless you're deal with, dealing with a sadistic, barbaric God, God forbid, it. how can anybody think of it in such terms? The whole idea doesn't make sense. You have to appreciate that all of Yiddishkeit is about Hashem's infinite love for you. God giving you an opportunity to live life to the fullest, the gift to maximize your life physically, emotionally, psychologically, socially, and spiritually. Of course, imperfection is part of the human condition. And who's punished for imperfection? That concept is, doesn't completely not exist. Of course you're not punished for imperfection. In fact, it's imperfection that makes you so beautiful. That's exactly why Hashem loves you, because you're imper imperfection, not despite your imperfection. Remember, God is perfect. He's not looking for perfection. He got himself for perfection. Before the world was created, there was all perfection. And even after the world is created, you have all the angels screaming, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. They're perfect. They're impeccable. They're pre-programmed spiritual saintly computers. They're called Chayos HaKadosh, holy animals, to scream Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish. You know why Hashem loves you? Because of your imperfection. Because of my imperfection. Because the fact that we are the manifestation of God in finiteness. So there is room for growth. Infinity, absolute perfection can't grow. It's just perfect. It's perfect. It's wonderful. There's no growth. How does Hashem experience growth? Hashem experiences growth through you, through me, through us, because we are the peace of God that's manifested in a body, in a physical world. We have conflict, we conflicts, we have various cravings and habits and addictions. We deal with trauma, we deal with issues. And yet we confront our darkness and we transform it into light. That's called transformation. That's called growth. This is why God loves you. So I want you to look at your imperfections completely differently. Don't look at your imperfections as a reason that God is going to punish you. That does not exist. That does not even make sense on any level. It's your imperfections that make you so special. It's what makes you unique. It's why Hashem wants a relationship with you. That you could look at your imperfections and grow from them and learn from them. And that's why the Medrash says that tshuva precedes the universe. Tshuva kadma la'aylam, in the beginning of Bereshis. Why? Doesn't tshuva come for sin? How can tshuva precede the universe? The answer is Hashem made the world in a way that people can make mistakes. Why would he do this? I make you in a way that you could make mistakes. Oh, so now I can punish you. Wonderful. Is this how even a normal mother would think about her child? Imagine, you tell your child to do a chore in the kitchen, a task, and you know that probably 90% they won't be able to do it, and then you could punish them, you can take away all their privileges, you could take away all their treats. What would you call such a mother? You know what you would call such a mother. Why are you attributing such qualities to Hashem <laughs> who conceived you in love? It's completely different. Hashem knows that we fail. And failure is essential to the journey of growth. Next time you fail, 
Look at your failure as what makes you special when you learn from it, when you grow from it. Racheli, this is very, very important. Thank you for your question. Mardechai Dov from Manchester. Welcome, Manchester. Can we have a brief explanation? What was the sin of the students of Rabbi Akiva? The Gemara says in Yevamais that the students of Rabbi Akiva died between Pesach and Shavuos and because their death was because they didn't respect each other. Obviously, it wasn't a simple case of disrespect. How did Rabbi Akiva not pick up on their behavior and educate them accordingly? Wonderful question. I saw a few teenagers ask this question, which means we should address it. So let me address this question. And uh, I'll do it briefly. You know, the interesting thing, of course, is, right, that the students of Rabbi Akiva died from a pandemic. And the name of this pandemic is called Askara. It's mentioned in Maseches Yevamis, page 62, I think, Davsamach Beis Amit Beis. 24,000 students died from a terrible, terrible epidemic, a magefa, which we call a pandemic, a disease that traveled from person to person, and it was so infectious and it traveled so swiftly that it claimed the life of 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. Unfortunately, this year, we hear such a story, I'm like, hmm, yes, in six weeks, in six weeks, 24,000 students died from this pandemic, Ascara, which we call in English diphtheria, diphtheria. And it's a bacteria which enters into the body. It affects the brain. It could create swelling in the brain. It affects the heart. It creates the, it affects the glands in the neck. Uh, it like blows up. It becomes inflated. Diphtheria, Ascara, and they all died. And, uh, the Gemara says that the spiritual reason was because they didn't respect each other. And of course, you're right. They were great men. They were students of Rabbi Akiva. The Torah calls them students of Rabbi Akiva. Obviously, they were great men, and they were worthy of that title. So the point being is as follows. Because they were students of Rabbi Akiva, they were extremely sensitive and zealous about the teachings of Rabbi Akiva. What does Rabbi Akiva teach? Loving your fellow Jew is the great principle of Torah. So how could it be that his students should stumble in this teaching, which their own Rebbe embodied and taught? Something doesn't make sense here. If I'm your student and I'm so loyal to your teachings, how could 24,000 of us violate one of your most cardinal principles that every Jewish child knows? And the answer, my dear friend, Reb Mardechai Doi from Manchester, another Kevna who asked this question is, it's precisely that point. You see? And I want you to understand this very well. Because they were such zealous students of Rabbi Akiva, therefore, they knew that what's their main responsibility? To love somebody. Because that's the main principle of Torah. Of Torah. Now, when they saw a friend who had a different path in Avaida Sashem, he did things differently. Because, you know, every soul has its own path in Avaida Sashem. And this addresses another bunch of questions that people asked. Every soul has its own path. Of course, there are things we all do the same way. We all keep, we all celebrate Shabbos, and all the men, all the boys put on tefillin, and the girls light Shabbos candles, or the women light Shabbos candles. And we eat kosher, and we celebrate Pesach, and we eat cheesecake on Shavuos, and we do Sviris Eimer, and the 613 mitzvahs include all of the Jewish people, although there are some mitzvahs for Kayanim, and some mitzvahs for Leviim, and some mitzvahs for kings. But there are the mitzvahs that bind all of us. We're all in the same boat. But then there is the individual path in Yiddishkeit that is unique to every single neshama. Aaron Hakoyen lit a menorah of seven branches. You know why? Because there are seven types of souls. There are souls that are rooted in the world of Chesed and Gvura and Tiferes and Netzach and Hoyd, Yisoyed, Malchus. And Aaron Hakoyen was kindling the flame in each one of those seven types of souls. But each one of those seven branches off in so many other categories. It's like the human body. There's one body, but how many cells are there in your body? You know how many cells there are in your body? There's one body. Look, one body. B-O-D-Y, but how many cells? Around 50 trillion cells, or some people say 100 trillion cells. And you know the difference between 50 and 100 trillion cells is pretty big, but I wouldn't know it because I don't know what 50 trillion is either. I never saw 50 trillion things. There are 50 or 100 trillion cells in your body, and each cell has its unique function. 
There are 37 trillion red blood cells and hundreds of billions white blood cells and other trillions of cells. And each cell has its unique function, even though we're all in one living organism. And the student of Rabbi Akiva, I'm looking at my friend, and he has a different way of looking at things or a different way of serving Hashem or a different attribute or a different characteristic he brings to the table. And I say to him, this is not the way to do it. And because I'm a student of Rabbi Akiva, I am passionate about via haftal recha And when he disagrees with me, what happens? I can't respect him anymore. I'm not a liar. I'm not going to be a con artist. I'm not going to smile on the outside and internally feel negatively towards him. I'm going to tell him what I think. And they stopped respecting each other. They stopped trusting each other. They became alien from each other because they were students of Rabbi Akiva. What a fascinating, profound idea. And it's something that we struggle with. It's very hard for many of us, not only to tolerate, but to celebrate the diversity of Jewish life. Somehow, if you are not doing it my way, somehow if you have a little bit of a different angle, a different perspective, a different experience, a different emotion, instead of celebrating our diversity, I'm like getting annoyed with you. And I like feel that in order for me to be holy, I have to knock you. And that's, and that's a pandemic. You know, there are physical pandemics and there are spiritual pandemics. And the two, the Gemara is saying, are connected. So the important thing to learn from this whole story is differences are never a reason to create this respect. And you are the future leaders of the Jewish people. I am speaking now to the best and the brightest bunch of the Jewish people. You are young, you are idealistic, you are energetic. By now we have just tonight, I think more than 200 questions that came in. They are brilliant questions. They are beautiful questions. They're amazing questions. I'd love to sit here with you for a few nights and go through all the questions. We try as best as we can. I'm gonna go through another few questions. And I'm looking at you. You are our future leaders. Remember this lesson. Remember this lesson. Every one of us is an ambassador of love. An ambassador of love doesn't mean I always agree with you. I may have a different path. I may have a different perspective. We may have disagreements. That's fine. Because Avoidas Hashem is not generic. Every person has a different personality. If you have a different personality, you're supposed to serve God differently than me. Because if you would serve God just like me, then why did God create you different than me? You have your own mind, your own soul, your own heart, your own consciousness. Every soul has its own color, its own flavor, its own fabric. You have to serve Hashem the way you serve Hashem, and it's not the way I serve Hashem. And together, we create the beautiful concept called Knesset Yisrael, what I spoke in the beginning, Meshpacha, we're all cells in one organism. We are all musicians in one symphony. Not all musicians are playing the same instrument. And we are all notes in one divine ballad. Not all notes are uniform. If every single note would sound the same, you know what the song would sound like? Uh... There is the diversity of notes that then come together to create an exquisite song. You have an indispensable note to play in God's cosmic symphony as you and 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 you. I'm not going to go through every single one who's watching or listening, but every single one of you is a note. Play that note beautifully, and by playing your note, you help me play my note because we then create together this amazing, amazing ballad. Let me do a, another few questions. Wow, I love these questions. Gewaldic. I just, <laughs> wow, there's so many hundreds of questions. Well, okay. Ooh. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I do want to say one more thing before I take the last questions on this. A lot of you are asking questions that I already addressed in previous weeks. A lot of you. So I'm just going to ask you if you could listen to the programs of the previous weeks. We already did three programs with teenagers the last Thursday nights, and they're all on our website, theyeshiva.net. And you'll hear a lot of, not all of your questions, but a lot of your, a lot of your questions will be answered and also, 
I want to tell you that uh, next Sunday, Sunday at 2 o'clock, we have a program for children in Yiddish. And Sunday at 4, we have a children, a program for children in English. Sunday at 1, we have a program for adults. It's a Zoom chat with the community in Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona. The world has changed. Have we changed? That's Sunday, 1 p.m., New York time on the yeshiva.net. Sunday at 2, children in Yiddish. Sunday at 4, children in English. And next Thursday, we're going to take a break. We're not going to have our teenage session next Thursday. God willing, we will resume afterwards. Let's take another few beautiful questions my dearest, dearest friends. Okay, this is a big one that came in from quite a lot of people and already a few weeks. And because it came in for a few weeks, I'm going to address it. I want to find there were a few of them. Okay. I would really, I would really love if you can explain the role of a woman in Judaism including a girl, including a life, a wife. I really don't understand it. Can you really address it? I feel like the Torah was created for men, and we are basically like the shlak shamish. The shlak shamish is we're behind the scenes, we do the laundry, we do the cleaning, we do the cooking, we do the serving, and I feel like a second-class citizen, I feel unappreciated, I feel used, the religion is around men, it revolves men, it's for men, and it's completely not for women. And I really feel used, and it makes me frustrated, and it makes my friends very, very frustrated. Excellent question. Excellent question. And a few other girls sent in this question. Let me, let me read another question. I am a girl, a graduate of Beis Yaakov, Beis Yaakov recently, and I always feel that they're patronizing us. Oh, we are also important. Yes, Benos Melech, we're daughters of the king, and we're going to build families, and we're going to be mothers, and we're going to be Tzniyazdik. But bottom line, all of the action of Judaism happens by the boys and by the men. They have the mitzvah to learn. They learn all the interesting things, and we are subservient to them. We are told that our husbands have to learn and we just have to be in the kitchen and make good food and do the laundry and clean the house and raise the kids. Whew. <laughs> wow, okay. It's a great question. Number one, I'm going to ask you to listen to our kids program we did on Sunday and some girls addressed this, and it was a very interesting conversation with younger children. I think it would be interesting for you. But let me address this. Let me try to address this briefly. Now, you may feel that I'm being apologetic. In other words, I'm just saying the right thing to be nice, but it's not really truthful. You may feel that way, and I understand. And I understand why you feel that way. But I want to let you know that if you can really explore this with people who are in the know and with texts that address this in a real way, you will be able to see a much larger picture. And I really feel that your paradigm, your reference point is erroneous. And I'm not blaming you. I understand why. This is a very, very common question. I get this all the time. But I really, really feel your reference point is mistaken, and it's really not your fault. And it's also not your teacher's fault. It's the fault of a lot of factors together, but it's important really to go back to the core and to be very, very honest about this and to ask, what is the foundation of Judaism? What is the essence of Yiddishkeit? Not the details of Yiddishkeit. What is the essence? What is Yiddishkeit based on? What is it based on? What is the essence of Yiddishkeit? Is it getting an aliyah in shul? Is it being the chazan? Is it being the rabbi of a shul? Is it being in a yeshiva? What is the essence of, of, of Judaism? Is it putting on tefillin? Is it putting on tzitzis? Is it davening shachris menchamayr? Now, these are all part of fundamental aspects of Judaism. 
But I want to go back to the beginning, to the genesis, to the foundation. There's no question that there are two foundations for all of Judaism. Two foundations. Parshas Bereshis and Parshas Yisroi. Creation and revelation. Number one, that the Rebbeinu Shalom created the world. Bereshis Baruch Lekimus HaShemayim V'Sa'aretz. Hashem conceived the world in love. He created the entire cosmos, planet Earth, and of course humanity. Hashem created the world. He cares for the world. He is responsible for the world. He is the ruler of the universe. That's foundation number one of Judaism, called Bria Sa'olam. There's a second foundation of Judaism. That Hashem communicated to the Jewish people and through them to humanity a blueprint for life, how to live. Not just Hashem created the world and then moved on and went on vacation. But there's a blueprint for life. In other words, there's purpose and meaning in creation for us to live according to the divine blueprint in order to turn our lives and the whole world into the space that was imagined by God. Or in simple words, to reveal the oneness in the diversity of creation. To reveal the infinity within the finite. Two foundations of Judaism, Bereshus and Yisra. That is Yiddishkeit. Everything else derives from that. As we always say in every mitzvah, or many mitzvahs, Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, which followed Matan Torah, Pesach is always followed by Shavuos 50 days later. When you look at those two foundations of Judaism, now you have to ask a question. Look at those two foundations and answer this honestly. Are men superior to women in those two pillars of Judaism? And when you look in both portions, it's very clear what the Torah says. When it comes to the creation of the world, what does it say? B'Tselem Eloikim bara oisoi v'zachar unekeva bara oisam v'yikra shmam adam. Adam and Chava were created as one, as the Gemara says in Erev in Yudches, they were created as Siamese twins. In the image of God, together they are defined as Adam. Meaning in terms of a human being and the dignity of a human being created in the image of God, is there a difference between man and woman? Absolutely not. Somebody, Khalila, takes the life of a woman. Are they guilty any less than they take the life of a man? Absolutely not. Same sentence. And when it says in the Mishnah that one soul is like the whole world, if you save one soul, you save the world. Which soul is that? A man and a woman. And when it says a person is supposed to say, for me, the world was created. For me, that's man and woman alike. The woman has to say, for me, the world was created. What about Matan Torah? Hashem tells Moshe, speak to the house of Yaakov and then speak to the sons of Yisrael. Who's the house of Yaakov? What does Rashi say? What do Chazal say? Hashem told Torah to teach. Hashem told Moshe to teach Torah first to who? To women. Before Bnei Yisrael. That's why when Sarah Shneur had to create the girls' institutions, the girls' school, she named it Beis Yaakov. Your alma mater. <laughs> One second. But I thought Torah is men, 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 men. Yisrael doesn't say that. Hashem tells Moshe, who's a man? You're going to teach Torah? The first thing, make sure you teach it to women. So I completely think we have to appreciate the truth. To say that women are second-class citizens and that your purpose is to do the laundry for the men and to cook and to serve and to be a shlak shamish and to be a schlepper for the men is a complete erroneous distortion of Judaism in the truest and most authentic manner. Different, but equal. Men and women are different. We're different biologically, yes. <laughs> Despite any, but what anybody likes to say, we are different in many ways, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, the biological differences between the genders is a reflection of differences between men and women on every level. Different, but equal. Different roles, different missions, different ways of operating in life, different experiences, different mitzvahs, but equal, of course equal. And if you'll ask me what is the most important thing in the Jewish world, it's creating a new generation. So now answer me a question. If I'm the CEO of a company that produces pencils, I'm considered a very prominent man. But if I'm the woman who gives birth 
to the future of civilization and in the earliest formidable years is the most responsible for creating a new generation of humanity and a new generation of Jewish people. That is absolutely the most significant mission and role in the world that surpasses everything else. And you go to any psychologist or therapist from any demographic and group and they'll tell you that so much of life is dependent on what happened during childhood. And not when you were 17, during your earliest, earliest years, which we see then how impactful mommy is. And now go to the Torah itself and look through Sefer Beratius and tell me, who makes the most important decisions that change history, men or women? Who decided that Adam Harishan should eat from the tree of knowledge? A man or a woman? You know the answer. Go through the story. Who decided that Yishmael should be expelled from Avram Avinu's home? A man or a woman? You know the answer, a woman, Sarah. Who decided to go to God and figure out what is happening in her womb? A man or a woman? A woman, Rivka. And who decided that Yaakov, not Esau, should get the blessings? A man or a woman? A woman. And who ultimately decided that Yaakov, should marry a different woman, Leah instead of Rachel. Two women together, Rachel and Leah. And who decided that Yehuda should go and have a relationship with Tamar? Who decided? Yehuda or Tamar? And ultimately from there came Malchus Beis David. And who decided that Yosef should be cast into prison? which ultimately changed and saved the whole world. Again, unintentionally, but it was a woman. Her name was Patifer's wife. And who decided that Moishala, baby Moishala, should be retrieved from the Nile Delta and saved a woman and not even a Jewish woman. Her name was Batya, the daughter of Parai. The Gemara says in Saita, she converted to monotheism. And because of that woman, we have Moshe Rabbeinu, which means we have Torah and we have Yeshivas and we have men and we have Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and we have Matan Torah because of a woman, a non-Jewish woman. And who decided to perform the act of civil disobedience the first time in history and not kill the Jewish males in Egypt, which allowed the foundation of Klai Yisrael. Two women. Shifra and Pua. Some even say they weren't Jewish. It's an argument in the Mepharshim, although Rashi from Masech the Saita says it was Yechevet Miriam. You just read through Sefer Beratius, and what do you see? The most important historic events that changed history happened through women. Thank God, all these women, all the way to Esther Hamalka, didn't look at themselves as Shlak Shamoshim. They understood who they were. They were the ambassadors of Hashem who were responsible for the future of civilization and the future of the Jewish people. They understood that they have the greatest and most sacred mission, which is to keep their eye on eternity and to create a foundation within a Jewish home, a foundation for Jewish life that allows all of the spiritual growth and all of the mitzvahs of men. That is the truth about how Judaism perceived and perceives and will perceive women. My dearest, dearest teens, the hour is late. There are more than a lot, a lot of questions left, but the hour is late, so therefore we're going to cut it here. Reminder, next Thursday, we're taking a break. We will resume the class. We're not stopping. We're taking a break for next Thursday. So... (laughs) <laughs> you'll have a little break for me. And Sunday, 2 o'clock in Yiddish for children, 4 o'clock for children in English, 1 o'clock Sunday for adults. The title is The World Has Changed. Have We Changed? All on the yeshiva.net. Please enjoy your week. Enjoy your Shabbos. Live life to the fullest. I love you so, so much and send you my love and blessings. Thank you very much. Good night. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.